My name is William Hahn. I am your IMB missionary uh, in the country of Ghana in West Africa. My family here, my uh, 13-year-old son, Trey, my daughter, KJ, and my wife, Heidi. KJ is four years old now, and we've been in Ghana for five years, so she was born there, and it's been quite fun. This is her first time in America, and she just loves it. Uh, I took her to, went to Walmart when we first got back, and we walk into this super Walmart, which is kind of overwhelming, um, and she goes up to the produce section, and she just yells at the top of her lungs, Daddy, they have pineapple like in Ghana. I'm like, yes, they have pineapple in America too. And she's just always like, everything's just so wonderful and exciting to her. Um, Ghana, for those who don't know, is in West Africa. And that little pin there is where we are in the city of Nalergu, or town or village. Um, and it's way up in the northeast corner. That part of the world in West Africa, it's the Sahel, so we're not quite into the Sahara Desert, but we're not down to the rainforest below, so it's a really kind of sparse landscape, grasslands, uh, not a lot of trees and stuff. And we work with the Mamprusi people there. And the Mamprusi are a tribe of about 200,000, and they, most of them practice folk Islam and African tradi traditional religion, or a mix of the two. And so that's where we've been for the last five years, and after this year in the U.S., we'll be going back there next June. We are at a, a hospital in northern Ghana called the Baptist Medical Center. And this uh, hospital was built in the 1950s by the International Mission Board. So if any of you were uh, members of a Baptist church in the 1950s and you gave your tithe every Sunday and you gave to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, you helped build this hospital way back then that my wife and I serve at now. And so we thank you. There were a lot more people, I think, who were from the 1950s in the first service. But our hospital is still uh, serving people, and uh, the population in the area has grown a lot since the 1950s. We see 60,000 clinic patients every year, and about 10,000 uh, patients are admitted into the hospital. Why are we at a hospital? Well, my wife is a surgeon. She's a general surgeon, and she's the only surgeon at the hospital. And so every year, um, her surgery department does about 1,200 major operations, and uh, over 3,000 minor ones, which are little lumps and bumps and things like that. Now, as a surgeon, she uh, likes to talk about the work that she does, and she has her own little medical presentation that she does sometimes, and it's not for the faint of heart. So I'm just going to tell you that she's a rock star and uh, not show you all the pictures of what she does, but it's kind of awesome that she has a power tool there that she's using. Um, she does a lot of... Um, hernia repairs, she does typhoid perforations, a lot of GI stuff, but then she has to handle any trauma and every trauma that comes into the hospital. Um, so she definitely gets her hands <laughs> dirty, so to speak, in uh, all sorts of different parts of uh, surgery. Now, what do I do? So I am not as smart or as cool as my wife. I'm not a surgeon, I'm not a rock star. Um, and so I have a job with the IMB in the media department. And so I also homeschool my kids. So in the next slide, you see my kids here. And my kids, uh, Trey is 13, so I homeschooled him the last five years. It was a real challenge. I had never done that before. And then uh, there's KJ and our other kid, Spider House. Spider House is a blind goat that my kids adopted, and the three-year-old decided to name him Spider House, which is a common name for goats, right? And Buster, our dog. Homeschooling is what I do when I'm around, but when I work for the media department for the IMB, I'm traveling all over the world. So here I am in East Asia with my colleagues having a meeting. Um, because we travel into sensitive parts of the world where Christianity is not welcome, um, I can't show you their faces, and they'll probably be mad at me that I showed you my face, but I'm like, I'm here, so I can show you my face. Um, but we go all over the world, and we cover the work that uh, your IMB missionaries are doing. Uh, as a kid, I loved National Geographic, the IMB used to have a magazine called Commission Magazine, and I always dreamed of wanting to work for that, and now I get to do that. I call it National Geographic for Jesus. I get to travel all over, document cultures, uh, meet people, and it's fantastic. I love it. My specialty is in photography and videography, so you've probably seen some of my stuff and you didn't know it. It shows up in IMB materials for Baptist Global Response and uh, the IMB. When I'm not traveling for that, when I'm back home and homeschooling my kids in Ghana, 
Um, I also preach in the, in the local churches, the Mamprusi churches. We have, thanks to that hospital that was built in the 50s, it's been there 60 years, we have 40 churches that have been planted in villages around in the area. And so I kind of circulate through the villages and as kind of like an itinerant preacher and uh, partner with the pastors and, and preach uh, when I'm not traveling. So what I want to get into today, that's a brief overview of what we do, but I want to get into this task that we as international missionaries have. As international missionaries, we've got to take the gospel to different cultures. And it's a challenge because here I am, a white American with my worldview, and I go somewhere completely different, and I have a hard time communicating. I can learn the language, but there's more to cross-cultural communication than just knowing the language. And so I want to kind of walk you guys through what my family did in the last five years. And this is what most of your IMB missionaries are doing, the ones all over the world, is getting into a culture, learning the culture, learning the language, and trying to understand how the people communicate and how they understand things, because we want to be able to communicate the gospel. So one thing I learned early on is that in West Africa, they love stories because they're an oral people. And so what we do when I preach, I usually start with a folk story that comes from their own culture or a proverb that comes from their own culture. So I'm going to tell you one of these stories this morning. And as I tell the story to you, you're going to be listening and your mind's eye is going to conjure up pictures. And then we're going to talk about that afterwards. Okay. So this is the story of the lost son, the legend of the lost son. It's an actual Mamprusi uh, legend that we learned. And uh, they also call it the fire festival story. So here's how it goes. Centuries ago, The Nairi, or the king of the Mamprusi people, the overlord of Mamprugu, he was in his palace with his children. And he sent all his young princes out to the field, and they worked in the farm, and they played. And they were playing in the field. And while they were playing, one of the princes, he walked over under this big tree, and he laid down, and he fell asleep. He fell into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, the other kids kept playing, and it started to get dark, so they all went back to the palace. So when they got back to the palace, they did what they do, eat dinner, bathe, send them off to bed. And the king was talking to one of the queen mothers, and they realized that one of the princes wasn't there. So they woke everybody up. They searched the whole palace compound. They didn't find him. So the king, now concerned, he called the warriors, and the warriors came to the palace, and he told them, my son's lost. So they fired their guns in the air. The drummers came. They started drumming. They woke the whole village up. The whole village came to the palace, and the king said, my son is lost. We need to go out and find him. So there's no electricity. So he took some thatch and he made a little torch and he lit it on fire and he held it out and everybody else got thatch and they lit their torches on his and they fanned out in the village looking all over for the sun. They didn't find him in the village. They got to the edge of the village, still no sign of him. Then they started to go into the bush and finally someone found him and he was sleeping under the tree and they woke him up and they took him and everyone took their flaming torches and they threw them on the tree and burned the tree and carried the sun all the way back to the palace. And when they came to the palace, carrying the son, the king rejoiced because his son that was lost was found. And he said, from this day on, we're going to have a festival every year called the Fire Festival. And we're going to celebrate this moment because my son was lost and now he's found and I don't want us to forget that. And so every year to this day, they have this festival. It comes around September, October. Everybody goes to the palace. And the king comes out The uh, warriors fire their guns in the air. They play their drums. He throws his burning thatch on the ground and everybody rushes in to light their own fires and then they party all night long. We don't get a Halloween where we are, so that's the closest thing. My son likes it. We like going out there. What 12-year-old boy doesn't like a license to play with fire, right? So that's the story of the lost son. So you guys heard the story and I mentioned the word king. In your mind, you probably had a Western view of a king, and probably our most famous in Western mythology is King Arthur. Maybe that's the kind of king you were thinking of. But this is our actual king. This is Nabuhaga. Nabuhaga Abdullahi Mahami Shirga. It's a long name. Um, interesting thing, the Buhagu there uh, means viper. Every king, when they become king, they pick a throne name, and they pick a name that's going to represent how they're going to rule their tribe. And so Bohaga is a puff adder, and a puff adder is a snake, and it's not aggressive unless you step on its tail. If you step on it, it'll come around and bite you. And so that's what he chose as his throne name. Shirga at the end is his grandfather's name, and that was the king 
that gave the IMB missionaries who went there in 1957 the land to build the hospital, hospital that we now serve at. So there's Nayiri Nabuhagu Abdullahi Mahami Shirga. A little different from King Arthur. What about the palace? I mentioned a palace, a castle. I didn't say castle, I said palace for that reason. Probably thought of this, a bunch of Floridians in here. Uh, we love our Disney. Well, the palace in Nalergu, where we live, is much smaller. And uh, it's a pretty simple thing, that's it. They actually recently painted it hot pink. I don't have an updated photo, but that's the, that's the old version. <laughs> And then I mentioned a prince and a tree. Again, going with the Disney idea here. Maybe this is what you were thinking. But we live in the Sahel and the savanna, and so we don't have forests and stuff. And probably the largest, most distinct trees that we have are baobab trees, that big gnarly-looking thing over there. And I said a prince. Well, these are the princes, um, the today's princes. When you're a prince today, one of your jobs as a young boy is to collect grass for the king's horses. And... Uh, in the rainy season, I have a really hard time keeping up with cutting the grass in my lawn. And so the princes love to come to my house because they'll cut my grass and then take it back to feed the horse. And they usually get some treats and stuff from me. So they like to come hang out. Very different probably than what you were picturing in your mind. And so that's the whole point of learning a culture's stories and worldview and mindset is because we want to be able to communicate to them. Another thing in the story that you probably didn't think of, is I said the, the boy fell asleep under the tree. Now, why do you think he fell asleep? We're logical, rational people, us Americans. He got tired, right? He was playing hard, he fell asleep. Well, in West Africa, the worldview, they hyper-spiritualize everything. They believe there's evil spirits everywhere that are trying to affect us. And so that's why they burned the tree at the end, because they rescued him and they wanted to destroy whatever evil spirit was in that tree. That's where their mindset goes. We see this all the time in the hospital. Patients come in with a cancer or something, and they've for years been trying to treat it with some kind of local medicine, exorcisms and stuff, but my wife comes and sees them and it's too late, and now it's a giant tumor. And so we deal with that all the time. So this time we spent, five years over there, we learned the language, we learned the stories, and we learned the culture, and all for the goal of reaching the lost and being able to communicate the gospel to them. So I'm going to walk through what we did. So when we first got there five years ago in 2014, we had to start with language learning. Now, this is my very educated wife. She finished high school and did 15 years of training, college, med school, residency, fellowship to become a surgeon. And here she is reduced to a three-year-old level, pointing at flashcards and saying, tree, dog, house. And I had to do that too, and it was very frustrating because you want to talk to people and communicate, and you can't even put a sentence together. And then you get to the point where you can, but it's a horrible sentence. Um, so it was very frustrating and difficult, and we had to do that for about a year to learn this language because it's a very hard language. The language has some tonal properties to it. So there's two words that to you probably sound the same, but there's a slight tone shift, and it gives them two different meanings. So there's zori and zori. Zori means tail. Zori means mountain. And there's pyo and pyo. Pyo means basket. Pyo means sheep. I had a fun time when I actually saw a guy putting a sheep in a basket. And I just kept saying, I was like, pyo, 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 pyo. And they're just like, what is he just saying? Sheep and basket over and over all the time. And I, just, I got a kick out of it. I kind of entertained myself that way. I would come up with, with puns, words that had double meanings and tongue twisters and stuff. Just to, because flashcards get really old when you're doing it three hours a day. Um, so my favorite tongue twister I came up with was da da di da dam da 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 kan da dani. I was so proud of this. So I went to town after I had figured out that I could say this phrase, and I'd go and I'd tell it to people, da da di da dam da 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 kan da dani. And they're like, yeah. I'm like, isn't that funny? Like, it, it's all these da's. And they're like, okay. And I go to one guy, and I say, da da di da dam da 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 kan da dani. And he looks at me, and he's like, I think you got something wrong. He's like, yeah. I'm like, what? He goes, yes, yeah, sugarcane isn't in season right now. So you couldn't have seen sugarcane in the market because the phrase is that last market day, a crowd of people bought sugarcane in the market. That's what that actually means. And he, but he doesn't see the humor in it at all. He's just like, no, 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 there's no way they bought sugarcane last market day because it's the wrong season. Are you sure it wasn't pineapple or something? I'm like, ah. Oh. So cross-culturally, humor's different. Puns, dad jokes, they don't work in Mampruli, I learned. Much to my son's happy. Uh, nice stuff. So what do we do? We went around for the first few years and just spent time with the people. 
One is to learn the language so you can hear how they talk and start to understand it. We learned there's two things that are really the most important things in someone's life is a baby naming and a funeral. So that is where they spend most of their time as communities. When a baby is born, here's my wife's friend Sala had twins. The women all go, they cook, and they just hang out for hours in the hut with the new mother who dresses up in her nicest, and it's like 110 degrees in there. But they just hang out and they talk and they gossip. My wife didn't gossip. Um, but they, they, they talk and spend time together. So when our daughter was born, we didn't know we had smuggled a baby to Ghana when we went. So nine months after our arrival, my wife uh, gave birth to our daughter, KJ. And so we said, well, they, they do baby naming ceremonies. Let's have a baby naming ceremony at the house. So we threw a party, 200 people showed up and we had to feed them all. And so my friends that I had made said, well, we'll get two sheep and we'll slaughter them and chop them up for you. And then my wife's friends, the ladies, they came out and they helped her cook and feed the 200 people. The party went off without a hitch. Five years later, people still talk about it. And they told us, okay, you need to take your daughter to the king and let the king name her. So we went to the king, Nabuahagu, and we said, okay, well, her name is Karen Jane. And the kind of root of that in our language is God's gift and holiness or purity. And he said, okay. He said, we'll just name her Wumpini Kasi. That's a good name. So he named her Wumpini Kasi, God's holy, perfect gift. We said, what a great way to talk about Jesus, right? He's God's perfect, holy gift. She reminds us of God's grace on us. Now, we also learned that when the king names your daughter, she's kind of like adopted as a princess. And so you're supposed to tack his name on to her name. So her full name is Nayiri Nabuahagu Abdullah Mahami Sherga Wumpini Kasi. But we've stuck with Wumpini for short. That's, that's what most people call her. I had a Ghanaian friend ask me when we were getting her passport stuff and all that. He's like, you're going to put her real name on the passport. When he says real name, he means that one. And I was like, well, America wants to have the English name on it. So we're going to go with the Karen Jane on official documents. Um, I then went and spent time with the men, doing what the men do. We farm. A lot of farming. <laughs> this is me weeding with my friend Cole Boogity, weeding the corn. Uh, I planted yams with him, watermelon, peanuts. And that was just the way for me to spend time with people, to develop relationships, and to learn the culture. I started learning uh, Creation to Christ, which is um, it's an evangelism method where you start with the story of creation and you work through the Old Testament, through the prophets, up to Jesus Christ. And it's a story that you can tell. So I was trying to learn in the local language and memorize it, and I would go out to the farm with him and recite it over and over to him. And he's a Muslim. And uh, he got to where he had memorized it, and he would correct me when I missed parts or say, hey, don't forget, you know, build up the suspense when Jesus is coming out of the tomb and these kind of things. Um, I'm still praying for him that those stories that he knows so well now will get to his heart and affect his, his decisions for his own life. As we became part of the community, we started being involved in the festivals that they held. We attended all the funerals that are so important in the culture. And myself, after time, after a couple years, I, was, uh, I started hanging out at the palace a lot with the sub-chiefs, and then they gave me my own chief name, and I became Sumisi Nachinaba. It sounds really fancy, right? What do you think it means? It means chief of the young white men. That's my title. <laughs> so my, uh, my authority in town covers about, well, let's see, if it's young white men, there's these two Germans, and there was one other American doctor for a while. Um, it was all, I just thought, you know, that's so cool, it's such an honor. And then I realized there's real responsibilities when one of the Germans started uh, acting up, and I had to deal with that and take care of that problem. Um, but uh, one of the things the chiefs do when you become a chief, you're allowed, they, they give you proverbs. And so whenever a chief comes to the palace, the drummers, they have these talking drums, and they'll play the drums, and what they're playing is the proverb. They play the tones of that proverb that's associated with that chief. Now, to this day, I can't hear it. It just sounds like a guy beating a big drum to me. But it's amazing that if I come into the palace, they'll start playing my proverb, and everybody knows that I'm coming, and the king inside knows that I'm coming to the palace. Um, that my two proverbs are, the first one they gave me is Wambugora, uh, and that means the one who doesn't travel thinks his mom's soup is nice. And they gave me that because I'm always traveling because of my media work with the IMB, and that's, I, that's my rationale. I'm like, well, I need to taste all the other soups in the world to find out if the one here is really the best. And then the other one they gave me, which I really, really loved, is budum sanabavi. 
And budun sanabavi means it's to the goat's, it's to the, sorry, it's to the dog's shame that the goat bites the stranger. So the idea being the dog has a job. He's supposed to bite the stranger that comes to your house, but the goat bit the stranger because the dog wasn't doing it. And they started using that when other Ghanaians from other parts of the country who don't speak our language would come and they would see that they don't speak Mampruli, but I do. And they would say that proverb to them that here's the white guy who speaks our language and here you are a Ghanaian and you don't speak our language. And it just really made me feel like I've kind of come and arrived as part of the community. And all this, all this time and all this community work and building relationships is so that we can sow seeds of the gospel. You see, the gospel, we have one gospel, and it's a universal gospel, universal in that it's meant for everyone, not in that it's an all-inclusive gospel, universalism. That is not it, but it's a universal gospel. The gospel that Pastor Jim shares with you in this church is the same gospel that we are taking to Ghana. It's the same gospel that messengers, missionaries take to China, to Japan, to Europe, to South America, but we have to present it in different ways. No one's going to understand it if Pastor Jim comes to my part of the world and gives the same sermon he gave here last week. It was a good one, too. I watched it online. Good job, guys. Um, and we have to learn how to communicate cross-culturally. And so when I told you that story about the fire and the lost son, did some lights go off in your head? Did it remind you of something? Right? Right? You probably thought of the, she the lost sheep or maybe the lost the prodigal son. Well, we made that connection too. When I first heard that story, I was so excited. A friend, I asked him, what's the fire festival about? And he told me the story. And I went home to my wife. I'm like, we've got to learn this story. This is great. It's a great bridge story. A bridge story is where you take something from a culture and you find a bridge to the gospel. It's an idea. It's a theme that they already have in their culture and their worldview. And you connect that and it walks them over to the gospel. So we learned the fire festival story in Mampruli. And then we went and we learned the story of the lost sheep. I'm going to be honest, it's a lot shorter than the prodigal son story, so that's why we learned that one. But it also has great connections. So then Heidi would go and sit with the ladies, and she would say, hey, I want to tell you a story. And she would tell them their story of the fire festival and the lost son. And their minds would be blown. And then she would say, and can I tell you another story from the Bible about Jesus? And she would share that. I did the same. I went, I hung out with my friends. There was this one little bench that I would sit with Kol Bugri and hang out and talk for hours and hours every day just to pick up language. And when I learned that story, he would call random people off the road and be like, hey, listen to this story. Listen to what he's going to say. And I would tell him, and they're like, what? And people, it was funny. Sometimes they'd just be confused. Like, this white guy speaks our language and he knows our story and our history. And then I could transition over to the story of the lost sheep. And I want to come to that verse in Luke 15, that parable that I know you're all familiar with, but I want to read through it, okay? Again, universal. Anyone in the world who hears this story, it resonates with them. Let me read it. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. I mean, I couldn't have made up a better legend to connect to this, right? And the brilliant thing about this passage is that Jesus then goes on to actually explain the parable. So there's no confusion about what they're rejoicing about. And it's about repentance. He says, Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons in need of repentance. You see, the context of this passage is that at the beginning of Luke 15, the Pharisees were grumbling that, oh, Jesus is hanging out with sinners all the time. And he went into these three parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal son or the lost son. And so he's talking to the 99 because the Pharisees were the religious establishment, and their job was to be a light, right? A light to the nations. They're supposed to be bringing people into the fold, and they were opposed to that, hanging out with sinners, hanging out with, with Gentiles. And it's a reminder to us, right? We're the, we're the 99 in this scenario because we are in the fold as Christians, as born-again believers, and we need to remember that there are still lost out there. And that term lost, we often kind of has a negative connotation, 
You know, you might talk about somebody did something bad and say, well, he's lost, you know, as if it's a, it's a bad thing. But in, this, in all these parables, it's not something that's just lost, but it's something that's precious to its owner. It's a precious sheep. It was so precious that the shepherd was concerned about it being out there, unsafe in the wild, and he brought it back. Then there's the parable of the lost coin. The old lady goes looking for the coin. Why is she so concerned about the coin, right? Well, a coin is worthless if it's not being used for its purpose. If, you're, if you got money, you probably have money in your sofa or between the car seats, right? That money's not doing anything. It's not accomplishing its purpose. And she wanted to bring it back so that she could use the coin to buy something, to bring pleasure to herself, to bring glory to its owner. And then we have the precious son, right? He made a choice himself to walk away, but the father who created him wanted him back, wanted to have him in a loving relationship because he was precious to him. So I want us to keep that in mind, that we're the 99 and the one is still out there. And the truth is, I don't know if you saw the number at the beginning, it's not one, it's 4,448,000,000 and change that have still not been reached with the gospel. Some of them just haven't heard. Others have no way of hearing the gospel because there's no one in their area or there's nothing in their language that can share the gospel with them. There's a beautiful picture at the end of Revelation, or at the end of the Bible in Revelation, Revelation 7, 9, where it talks about all the tribes and tongues and nations being gathered together, worshiping God, multitudes. And that's the work that your IMB missionaries are striving for. We've got 37, just about 3,700 missionaries all around the world, and they're proclaiming the gospel cross-culturally in other places, and they're taking the time to invest themselves in those communities and cultures so that they can do it effectively because this is the vision. This is the vision we have. That's a gonji player. That's one of the instruments in our area. It's a one-stringed fiddle. And I just, sometimes I sit in church and I just think about, wow, all these instruments, like we have cowbells that they play in church. We have these little castanet things, all these strange instruments. And I think, oh, imagine that, all that together, worshiping the Lord. One of my favorite things about speaking to Southern Baptist churches is I don't have to come to you begging for support. I don't have to come to you because as the video before greatly uh, explained, you guys give through the cooperative program. Every Sunday you give. I think it said 100,000, 105,000 your church is given to the cooperative program. And then every Christmas you have the Lottie Moon Christmas offering and everything from that goes straight towards the missionaries ministry work on the field. So the stuff that my wife and I are doing And so we're so grateful for that. I have colleagues in the area that are independent missionaries, and and it's just a struggle for them. It's a distraction from the work that they're doing because they're always concerned about, is this church going to keep sending the checks so that we can stay here and do it? And I get to thank you, as she said in the video, because you give, we can go. That's the reason. God put a calling on my life and my wife Heidi's life to serve in this way, and you guys make that possible for us. And so we're so grateful for that. I'm going to be around uh, for the next service And uh, this evening, I'll be speaking to one of the young adult groups. And if anyone wants to come talk to me about missions, uh, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy. This is my my contact info. If you're the social media crowd, I'm I'm really on Instagram more than Twitter. Um, But I'd love to hear from you and encourage you in your journey. Um, Pastor Scott is here. And as we close up and head to our final song, um, I just want to challenge you. You know, not everybody is called to be a surgeon in the bush in Africa. I get that. Not everybody's called to to travel around the world. I get that. Some of us want to, (laughs) but we're not called. But God has a purpose for you. Just like that lost coin, God has a purpose for you in his kingdom. And it may not be in Africa. It may not be in China. It might be here in this area. And it's so exciting to see all the opportunities that your church gives you to get plugged in locally and share the gospel in this area. Because the truth is, the people are coming to America. I can, I do this in, in St. Pete, Tampa area. I go to, uh, I look for hair braiding shops because all the hair braiding shops, it's almost always West African women in there doing the hair braiding. And uh, I like to go to those and that's how I connect with West Africans who are in America. But the nations are coming to you. There are probably over a hundred nations represented in this area. You just have to look for them or be willing to look at them. And so that's my challenge to you guys. Thank you so much for your time today. And if you want to come forward and pray with Pastor, he's right here. So thank you so much.